In this presentation, we will consider chapters 32 through 35 in the book of Alma. However, this presentation will be divided into two parts. We will first begin with just Alma chapter 32 because of the length and the doctrine that is found therein. We will do that one separately and then we'll do the second part, which would be 33 through 35. So let's begin with Alma chapter 32. Alma 32 to 35, an introduction. Alma and his brethren preached the word of God to the Zoramites who were in a state of apostasy. Because of their trials, a group of Zoramites were prepared to receive the word. Alma and Amalek's teachings concerning individual and institutional worship touched upon some of the most significant aspects of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of the atonement, repentance, faith, the word of God, and the importance of prayer. In addition to their own testimonies, Alma and Amalek drew upon the testimonies and messages of three ancient prophets. The doctrine and principles contained herein constitute a powerful witness of Jesus Christ. So with that, let's turn our attention to the 32nd chapter of Alma. Alma 32, the phrase, having faith in the word of God. A central point of Alma 32 is that of having faith in the word of God. Alma observed that when the word of God is planted in the fertile soil of the heart, it will begin to swell and grow. Through experimenting upon the word or nurturing it through obedience, the word of God will bring forth fruit that is most precious, sweet above all that is sweet, white above all that is white, and pure above all that is pure. Neglecting the word of God will result, result in no such fruit. How do we nurture our faith in the word so that we may re feast upon this fruit? President Joseph Fielding Smith taught, if we want to have a living, abiding faith, we must be active in the performance of everyday duty as members of this church. End of Joseph Fielding Smith's quote. Elder Joseph B. Worland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles similarly taught, quote, Faith exists when absolute confidence in that which we cannot see combines with action that is in absolute conformity to the will of our Father, our Heavenly Father. Without all three, first, absolute confidence, second, action, and third, absolute conformity, without these three, all we have is a counterfeit, a weak and watered down faith. That's a great statement on faith and some of the attributes that are needed to develop faith. Chapter 32 through 34, The Tree of Life. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles emphasized the importance of studying Alma 32 through 34 as a coherent whole. Quote, In the brilliant discourse of Alma 32, Alma moves the reader from a general commentary on faith in the seed-like Word of God to a focused discourse on faith in Christ as the Word of God, grown to a fruit-bearing tree, a tree whose fruit is exactly that of Lehi's earlier perception of Christ's love. Christ is the bread of life, the living water, the true vine. Christ is the seed, the tree, and the fruit of eternal life. But the profound and central tree of life imagery in this discourse is lost, or at least greatly diminished, if the reader does not follow it on into the next two chapters of the Book of Mormon. End of quote. Chapter 32, verses 1 through 3, the phrase, They began to have success among the poor class of people. Typically, when the gospel message goes to a nation or a city, the first willing to hear and accept it are those of the lower social classes. Humility of circumstance and humility of spirit are often found in company together. Writing to the Corinthian saints, the Apostle Paul observed, Not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. 
and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught things which are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Think of Joseph Smith. According to the world, he was a weak thing in the world. But look how he used that poor farm boy to accomplish such great accomplishments. As unfailing in is the case, Satan's plan in ensnaring the Zormites was to implant disunion and discord in their hearts. One of his favorite devices not only stir up rebellion among his servants, but to infuse those who would do his bidding with a sense of superiority over their co-laborers. Thus he creates class distinction among those who serve him. The rich and the poor are with him as tools with which he carves out the pattern of every apostate movement. First, he installs ambition in the hearts of men. They seek unrighteous dominion and conquest, and with flattering words would make followers of the weak and unweary. How often this course was followed by many Nephites. Strife, contention, and anger, angry passions were the legitimate children of their way of life. Among the Zormites, the rich esteemed the poor as filthiness and had no truck meaning to barter with them. Because of the coarse clothing worn by the poor, the rich cast them out of their place of worship and refused them any kind of communion as brethren. The sacred record states, therefore they were poor as to things the world, and also they were poor in heart. End of quote. Chapter 32, verse 4, the phrase pure in heart, poor in heart, I'm sorry. Such are the poor in spirit, spoke of Christ in the Beatitudes. The invitation to all such is the same as that given here by Alma. That is, to come unto Christ and be enriched by the fullness of the gospel blessings. Without Christ, we are all poor in heart. And that's why we must come unto him to become rich not only temporally, but especially spiritually. Chapter 32, verse 6, a phrase they were in preparation to hear the word. In order to receive or accept the word of truth, a person must be prepared to hear it. That preparation may come through enforced humility, as in the case with the poor Zoramites, or it may come voluntarily as one heart's yearns for the fulfillment of or peace of mind that can follow an introduction to God-given truth. It has been wisely observed that a blessing is anything that brings us nearer to God. Thus our afflictions often become our greatest blessings. It is in our extremities that most often we meet God, not in our comfort. Thus, any time conditions come to pass, even when at the time might be constructed as tragic or unfortunate conditions, that leads us towards the truth or contribute to our ev eventual well-being. We have indeed been blessed. Hence, the poor Zoramites were compelled to be humble due to circumstance. Voluntarily choosing to be humble would be meekness. Chapter 32, verses 8 through 16. The phrase, ye are lowly in heart, and if so, blessed are ye. Alma perceived the readiness of the poor Zoramites to be taught the gospel. Their rejection by the wealthy Zoramites contributed to their state of humility. Bishop Richard C. Edgley of the presiding bishop taught that humility and submissiveness are virtues allowing one to access gospel blessings. Many of us live or work in an environment where humility is often misunderstood and considered a weakness. Not many corporations or institutions include humility as a value statement or a desired characteristic of their management. Yet, as we learn about the workings of God, the power of a humble and submissive spirit becomes apparent. In the kingdom of God, greatness begins with humility and submissiveness. These companion virtues are the first critical steps to open the doors to the blessings of God and the power of the priesthood. It matters not who we are or how lofty our credentials are. Humility and submissiveness to the Lord, coupled with a grateful heart, are our strength and our hope. End of quote. Humility is important enough in the eyes of the Lord that he sometimes helps us be humble. 
Alma 32, 8 through 16 speaks of two ways to become humble. Verse 13 describes those who are compelled to be humble. Verses 14 and 16 speak of others who humble themselves voluntarily because of the word. Elder Carlos E. S.A. the Seventy also described these two groups. Quote, most of us seem to have the Nephite cycle as a part of our character. There is a point when we are teachable. Our humility enables us to grow and to ride the crest of spirituality. Then there are other times when we begin to feel self-sufficient and puffed up with pride. How much better it would be if we kept in remembrance our God and our religion and broke the cycle of constant worship and righteous living. By constant right worship and righteous living. How much better it would be if we, would hum, be if we were humbled by the word of the Lord and strong enough in spirit to remember our God in whatsoever circumstances we find ourselves. End of quote. President Ezra Taft Benson described ways that we could humble ourselves and avoid the trials that sometimes accompany being compelled to be humble. Quote, we can choose to humble ourselves by conquering enmity towards our brothers and sisters, esteeming them as ourselves, and lifting them as high or higher than we are. We can choose to humble ourselves by receiving counsel and chastisement. We can choose to humble ourselves by forgiving those who have offended us. We can choose to humble ourselves by rendering selfless service. We can choose to humble ourselves by going on missions and preaching the word that can humble others. We can choose to humble ourselves by getting to the temple more frequently. We can choose to humble ourselves by confessing and forsaking our sins and being born of God. We can choose to humble ourselves by loving God, submitting our will to His, and putting Him first in our lives. End of quote. That is a very important list. Chapter 32, verse 10, a phrase, Do you suppose that you cannot worship God, save it be in your synagogues only? Pure worship, though enhanced by mood and atmosphere, is in reality a matter of the heart. Individuals worship God Almighty in spirit and in truth as they humble themselves before Him as they seek to know and abide his will, as they ponder upon the glory and the wonders and beauties of his creations. Elder Bruce R. McConkie states, quote, Deity is worshipped in prayer, song, sermon, and testimony, by the making of covenants, offering of sacrifice, performance of ordinances, and the participation in religious rituals and ceremonies. He is worshipped by man's act of believing divine truths, by his being converted to them in their fullness. He may be worshipped in thought, word, and deed. But the most perfect of all worship comes from those who first believe the gospel, who then participate in its outward forms, and who fully keep the standards of personal righteousness that appertains to it. End of quote. We also worship Christ the Lord through emulation, through imitation, through seeking to be like him, through serving others and following in the spiritual graces until that perfect day when we are endowed by him with the fullness of the glory of the Father. Chapter 32, verse 12, the phrase that ye may learn wisdom. The wisdom learned by the poor segment of the Zoramites was that they were not at all self-sufficient that they could not save themselves, that happiness here and eternal reward hereafter could come only through the mediation and mercy of Jesus Christ. 32 verse 13, the phrase, Whosoever repenteth shall find mercy. To suppose that mercy is granted unconditionally is to deny God the attribute of justice. And to suppose that the wicked and rebellious are rewarded and blessed equally with the faithful. Chapter 32, verse 16. The phrase, blessed are they who humble themselves without being compelled to be humble, without stubbornness of heart. There are no blessings to be had in resisting the impressions of the Spirit. 
Surveys among converts to the church indicate that the great majority of them knew the message of the restoration to be true upon first hearing it. It is also generally true that those who respond most readily to the, their message of the missionaries continue after baptism to grow in the things of the Spirit more rapidly and sink in their spiritual roots deeper than those who confuse who confused intellect and independence of thought with stubbornness of heart. Chapter 32, verses 17 through 18. Faith, the phrase faith is not built upon signs. Elder Dallin H. Oaks, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, spoke of the dangers accompanying the seeking of signs for faith. Quote, the showing of a sign can work to the condemnation of those who are brought to a knowledge by this means. They miss the opportunity to develop faith, and they subject themselves to a more severe punishment for black backsliding than those whose spiritual development is proceeding along the normal pathway of developing faith. There are other condemnations to those who seek signs without first developing the faith God has required as a prerequisite. One condemnation is to be misled. God forewarned ancient Israel against following prophets who gave signs and wonders and then sought to lead them away to the worship of strange gods in Deuteronomy 13. The Savior taught his apostles that in the last days there shall also arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if possible they shall deceive the very elect who are the elect according to the covenant. In our day, God does not use miracles or signs as a way of teaching or convincing the unbeliever. As a result, we should not seek for signs for this purpose, and we should be deeply suspicious of the so-called spiritual evidences of those who do. End of quote. The purpose of signs, brothers and sisters, is to strengthen those who already have faith. Those who already have faith and are believing and are submitting to God, it then helps strengthen that. That is the purpose of signs, not to convert. Faith is a gospel requirement. Also, we have pointed out that some men refuse to believe his holy word. They, in their pre preemptory manner, demand that they be given a sign which will dispel all uncertainty from their minds regarding God and his relationship to the human family. But as Alma said to the Zormites, that if a man knoweth a thing, he hath no cause to believe, for he knoweth it. Belief in God is a motivating power which causes obedience to his laws, and it is easily understood when we consider the same incentive applied to other activities. Again, we quote from Elder Morgan, quote, To enable a man to perform any work whatsoever requires that he have faith in the ultimate result of his work. No farmer would plant seeds unless he accepted to reap. No builder build unless he accepted to inhabit. No speculator invest unless he expects to increase his means. No journey would be attempted unless there existed the hope of reaching the destination. So likewise, no commandment of God should be obeyed unless there exists faith that certain blessings would follow obedience. With this idea plainly before us, we can comprehend the assertion of the Apostle Paul to the Hebrews when he said, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. End of quote. Chapter 32, verse 19. More cursed, the phrase more cursed is he that knoweth the will of God and doeth it not. To impress upon the minds of his hearers that God is just and merciful and that he requires no more than he provides for, Alma stressed the vast difference in responsibility to one who through faith alone, one who only believes in God keeps the Lord's commandments, and one who notwithstanding greater knowledge nevertheless doeth it not. The one who knoweth the will of God and does not abide in it is more cursed than he who merely has faith or believeth and falleth into transgression. It, meaning the justice meted out, Alma said, shall be unto every man according to his work. By the word abide we, un by the word abide we understand its meaning, 
is to face or submit to a thing without shrinking. By the word abide, we understand its meaning, is to face submit without shrinking. I didn't read that the inflection very well, sorry. 32 verse 21, the phrase, faith is not to have a perfect knowledge. Faith and perfect knowledge are not incompatible. How else would God, whose knowledge is perfect, possess the attribute of faith? Alma is defining faith from the viewpoint of mortality, not the vantage point of the eternities. In our present world, faith serves as an insurance of the existence of the unseen. By contrast, in the lectures on faith, Joseph Smith spoke of faith in its unlimited, say, in its unlimited sense. Faith, he declared, is, quote, the principle by which Jehovah works and through which he exercises power over all temporal as well as all spiritual things. Take this principle or attribute, for it is an attribute from the deity, and he would cease to exist, end of quote. Among exalted beings, faith, then, is the first great governing principle which has power, dominion, and authority over all things, by it they exist, by it they are upheld, by it they are changed, by it they remain agreeable to the will of God. Without it there is no power, and without power there could be no creation nor existence. Again from the Lectures on Faith by Joseph Smith. Faith is a process, a divine process built upon knowledge and understanding of eternal righteousness. One may possess a slight amount of faith, having but little understanding of the principles of the gospel and living but a portion of the gospel law. Or one may possess that quality and kind of faith which Joseph Smith called faith unto life and salvation. We must remember that Alma is speaking to a people with little or no faith. They must be instructed simply and plainly, must build their knowledge and witness of truth slowly but surely. They do not know of the Christ, the necessity for the ordinances, or of the gifts and graces which are the companions of the saints. They must be nurtured slowly, for them faith and knowledge are almost at opposite ends of a continuum. On the other hand, to those who already possess enough faith to have come out of the world, to have believed in the Lord Jesus and accepted the words of his anointed servants, to such the process of faith is grandeur and more expansive. These come to understand the nature and kind of being that God is, and in so doing they come to appreciate that faith is a principle of power which characterizes the work of God. God has all knowledge. God has all faith. By virtue of his omniscience and his omnipotence, his command, he commands the things to come to pass. By virtue... By virtue of his perfect faith, this virtue and principle of power, he has absolute confidence that his word will be fulfilled and his command realized. In the eternal sense, Elder Bruce R. McConkie has written, because faith is the power of God himself, it embraces within its fold a knowledge of all things. This measure of faith, the faith by which the worlds are and were created, and which sustains and upholds all things, is found only among resurrected persons. It is the faith of saved beings. But mortals are in process, through faith, of gaining eternal salvation. Their faith is based on a knowledge of the truth within the meaning of Alma's statement that faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things, but that men have faith when they hope for things which are not seen, which are true. In this sense, faith is both preceded and supplanted by knowledge. And when any person gains a perfect knowledge on any given matter, then as pertaining, pertaining to that thing, he has faith no longer, or rather his faith is dormant. It has been supplanted by pure knowledge. End of quote. According to Joseph Smith, faith is built upon knowledge of three things. One, first, the idea of the existence of God. Two, a correct idea of his character, perfections, and attributes. And three, an actual knowledge that the course in life one is pursuing is according to the will, God's will. The first two prerequisites for faith in God have to do with the knowledge of God. They may be had through studying and searching and pondering the word of God and the testimonies of those who have known him. 
The third prerequisite has to do with ourselves. A person may have the assurance from the Lord that he is on the course only if he indeed is indeed on course. There exists in the souls of the faithful a constant yearning to improve, to repent, to bring their lives into harmony with the heavens. There also exists in those souls a quiet confidence born of the Spirit, a consciousness of increasing victory over self, a subtle but certain assurance and peace that the Lord is pleased. Such a knowledge, such a victory, comes only through an unconditional surrender to the will of the Master, only through a willingness to sacrifice all things for the kingdom's sake. President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, helps us better understand the meaning of faith. Quote, faith to be faith must center around something that is not known. Faith to be faith must go beyond that for which there is confirming evidence. Faith to be faith must go into the unknown. Faith to be faith must walk to the edge of the light and then a few steps into the darkness. If everything has to be known, if everything has to be explained, if everything has to be certified, then there is no need for faith. Indeed, there is no room for it. There are two kinds of faith. One of them functions ordinarily in the life of every soul. It is the kind of faith born of experience. It gives us certainty that a new day will dawn, that spring will come, that growth will take place. It is the kind of faith that relates us with confidence to that which is scheduled to happen. There is another kind of faith, rare indeed. This is the kind of faith that causes things to happen. This is the kind of faith that is worthy and prepared and unyielding and is call and is calls forth things that otherwise would not be. It is the kind of faith that moves people. It is the kind of faith that sometimes moves things. It comes by gradual growth. It is a marvelous, even a transcendent power, a power as real and as invisible as electricity. Directed and channeled, it has great effect. In a world filled with skepticism and doubt, the expression that seen as believing promotes the attitude, you show me and I will believe. We want all of the proof and all of the evidence first. It seems hard to take things on faith. When will we learn that in spiritual thing it works in things it works the other way about? That believing is seen? Spiritual belief precedes spiritual knowledge. When we believe in things that are not seen, but are nevertheless true, then we have faith. End of quote. Alma 32, verse 27, which are true. Alma defines faith as the hope for things which are not, not seen, and adds the very important qualification, which are true. Faith cannot successfully be exercised in falsehoods or untruths. Gods of wood and stone, gods created by the hands of men, cannot dispense the blessings of heaven. Nor is such power found in gods created in the minds of men and crafted by the witchery of words. Sincerity is commendable. Zeal is to be appreciated. But saving faith can be exercised only in that which is true. The formula for heaven's blessings is, and ever must be, that we worship in sincerity and in truth. Thus the Lord's people in the last days have been charged to serve him in righteousness and in truth unto the end. Illustrating this doctrine, Joseph Smith taught that it was through faith in the atoning sacrifice of Christ that Abel offered an animal sacrifice that was acceptable to God. Cain, however, offered of the fruit of the ground and was not accepted, but he could not do it in faith. He could have no faith or could not exercise con faith contrary to the plan of heaven which required the ritual to be a type of the shedding of the blood, Christ's blood, the prophet declared. That's why Cain's sacrifice was not acceptable. It did not point to the great and last sacrifice of the shedding of the blood of Christ, where Abel offering the lamb as a substitute for the Savior did point to Christ's atonement. 
President N. Eldon Tanner explained, the scriptures give us evidence of the reality and personality of God and his son, Jesus Christ. In order to believe in God, it is necessary for us to understand his nature and attributes. Our faith in him must be based on true principles. Faith will avail us nothing if it is based on a false premise. For example, some of the early American colonists in dealing with the Indians gave them gunpowder to plant with the promise that they could raise a crop of gunpowder powder. In explicit faith, the Indians planted their gunpowder, but of course they harvested nothing from their efforts because their faith was based on falsehood. End of quote. There is another facet of faith which is often misunderstood. Faith is not the power of positive thinking. Faith is not believing hard enough and then it will come to pass. That is not what it is. One does not have faith simply because he is positive or optimistic. Faith is based on the truth, the truth as God knows it, the truth as a manifestation of the will and pleasure of the Lord. We do need to be positive, for there is no virtue in being long-faced and dreary, but faith is another matter entirely. If a priest of bear is called upon to heal a dying man, for example, he does not command the sick one to rise from his bed of affliction in the name of faith when that faith is no more than wishful thinking or hope that the man will live. Working by faith is not the mere speaking of a few well-chosen worlds. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, quote, Anyone with the power of speech could have commanded the rotting corpse of Lazarus to come forth, but only one whose power was greater than death could bring life again to the brother of Mary and Martha. Nor is working by faith merely a mental desire, however strong that some events eventually shall occur. There may be those whose mental powers and thought processes are greater than any of the saints, but only persons who are in tune with the infinite can exercise spiritual forces and powers that come from him. Those who work by faith must first have faith. No one can use a power that he does not possess, and the pow faith or power must be gained by obedience to the laws on by which that its recipient upon which its receipt is predicated. And then, when the day is at hand, the hour has arrived for the miracle to be wrought, then they must be in tune with the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. He who is the author of faith, he whose power faith is, he who works are the embodiment of justice and judgment and wisdom and all good things, even he must approve the use of his power in the case at hand. Faith cannot be exercised contrary to the order of heaven or contrary to the will and purposes of him whose power it is. Men work by faith when they are in tune with the Spirit, and what they seek to do by mental exertion and by the power of the spoken word is the mind and will of the Lord. Faith is just not merely speaking words. It's when it is the will of the Lord and the Holy Ghost tells you it is the will of the Lord. Then one has faith to move mountains. In other words, faith is doing what God wants, how he wants it done, and when he wants it done, according to the will of God, even though we do not have a perfect knowledge of the outcome. Again, faith is doing what God wants, when he wants it, and how he wants it done. And that can only come from us being told that by the power of the Holy Ghost. Chapter 32, verse 22, the phrase, God is merciful unto all who believe on his name. Belief, humble belief, is the foundation of all, unright of, of all righteousness and the beginning of spiritual progression, wrote Elder Bruce R. McConkie. He goes on and says, It goes before good works, opens the doors to eternal store of heavenly truth, and charts the course to eternal life. With but few exceptions, belief is used in Holy Writ as a synonym for faith. Belief in Christ brings salvation. Failure to believe in Christ brings damnation. False systems of belief, religious belief, close the doors of heaven, 
while belief and principles of truth open those doors. It is one thing to believe God is a personal being in whose image man is made, as the scriptures attest, and quite another to believe he is a spiritual nothingness that fills the immensity of space as the creeds of Christendom aver. What men believe is the governing force in their lives. If they truly believe the truth, they will be saved in the kingdom of God. If they truly believe a lie, they will fail to gain this high reward. Salvation comes to those who believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rejection of his gospel closes the doors to salvation. Men believe his gospel are seeking to believe or do not believe. And if they do not, they must of necessity believe something else. Men do not and cannot live in a vacuum. They believe one thing or another. Disbelief in the gospel consists of belief in another thing that do, that do not lead to salvation. Thus God's holy word calls for a belief in Christ that is infinite and eternal. It is not a mere lip service declaration that he is the Savior, nor a mere confession with idle lips that he is the Lord of all. To believe in Christ in the sense of gaining eternal life is to believe his words and accept his messengers. It is to honor his prophets and take counsel from his apostles. It is to have the mind of Christ, to believe what he believes and to say what he would say in all situations. It is to abide in the truth and to keep the commandments. It is to enjoy the gifts of the Spirit, to work the works of righteousness and to perform miracles as he did. It is to believe in his name, to take that name upon us, and to have full confidence in the promises associated with our doing so. Chapter 32, verse 23. Who can receive revelation? Who can enjoy the ministry of angels? Who can dream dreams or see visions? Who is entitled to know the mysteries of God? Can we not reason that if God has spoken to so much as one of his children, that he is a just and impartial God, he then must be willing on the same terms to speak to each and all of his offspring? It is a strange notion that God has the power of creation, but not the power of communication. Indeed, all true prophets have testified of Christ, so they have testified that the voice of the Lord is unto all men. Could it be supposed that a wise and loving father would speak to his sons and not his daughters? That he would speak to the older children but not the younger? Are we to suppose that there is some power that binds his tongue and constrains the feelings of his heart? What a parent's heart could endure the thought of giving birth to children to whom he or she could not speak? Is it not reasonable to suppose that there is no more sublime joy known to exalted beings than that of guiding the path of their own children? See, modern Christian says that there is no more revelation. God does not speak to man anymore. How absurd that is. Why would not a father speak to his children? Chapter 32, verse 26, the phrase, You cannot know of their surety at first. There are no shortcuts to a testimony of the gospel. We cannot fully understand principles that we have not lived. As John 7:17 7, says, If any man will do his will, the Savior declared, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. The key being, if any man do his will, we must do it first. Then we come to know. An understanding of the principle of salvation does not come in an instant. The idea is demeaning to the principles involved. Joseph Smith did not come out of the sacred grove knowing all that was necessary for his salvation. He, like Christ, found it necessary to advance from grace to grace. To suppose that a, some sort of religious revival we can obtain all the knowledge necessary to be saved vulgarizes true religion. The divine injunction the prophet Joseph Smith taught is that we seek learning, even by study and also by faith. This that we might grow up in the knowledge of God and that we might receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost. Similarly, Paul admonished us to grow up in Christ in all things. The things of God, said the prophet, are of deep import and time and experience and careful and ponderous and solemn thoughts can only find them out. Chapter 32, verses 27 through 36. If you will awake and arouse your faculties, 
even to an experiment on my words. That phrase meaning, the following chart shows how we can develop faith and experiment upon the word. First, we must have desire, as Alma said in Alma 32.27. Have a desire to believe and let this desire work in you that you can give a place for a portion of his word. Once we have desire, then we must act. Alma 32, verses 28 through 29. You must now plant the word of God in your heart by living the principle, which, if it is a true principle, it will cause you to swell in your breast and enlighten your understanding and enlarge your soul. We must do his will before we come to know it. So we must then act upon it. And then the last step is a confirmation. Once we have desire, and because of that desire, we act upon the principle and live it, then, according to Alma 32, verses 30 through 35, as you live the principle of the gospel, you will gain a witness that it is of God, because it swelleth, sprouteth, and beginneth to grow in your heart. Thus it must needs be a good seed or principle, because truth is felt. As you continue to live the principle and cast, not cast it out, you come to a knowledge that it is a good principle or seed from God and you now now come to know that the principle is of God because you do because you doth begin to be enlightened and your mind doth begin to expand and you come to a perfect knowledge in that thing it is true and real because it is light and because it is light it is good it is from God and so then we receive a confirmation an example of this would be the law of tithing. I have a desire and believe that tithing is the word from a, a true principle and a, from the word of God. I act upon it. I pay my tithing. As I do so in faith and in believing and without doing it grudgingly, then the Holy Ghost will confirm that the law of tithing is a true principle. Then I have a sure knowledge in that thing. Then I come to know that tithing is a true principle, and I have faith no longer. And then we do this for every principle of the gospel to come to know if it's true. Is fasting a true principle? I have a desire to learn. I fast and live the principles of the fast. And then by the confirmation of the Holy Ghost, I come to learn that fasting is a true principle that leads one closer to God and so our submissive will, so smells our submissiveness to his will. Now we must remember throughout the process, you will receive a trial of your faith before you receive a witness. We learn in Ether 12.6. So that as we act, that doesn't mean everything is smooth and we have no problems. No, we will be tried and tested to see if we will obey no matter what the circumstances are. Then Alma 32, 36 to 38, this process must be done over and over again for each principle or doctrine to come to know their truth and not lay aside your faith. The word of God must needs be constantly nourished to get root and grow. So this is why we are constantly attending our meetings, reading our scriptures, seeking to live the true principles of the gospel so that we can, that we can learn and use this formula over and over and over, come again, over and over again so that we can come to a knowledge of the truth. First, having a desire, acting in faith, and then gaining a sure witness that the principle is true. And we constantly do that through our lives. This is a process until sometime long after this life, we will come to know all things and receive a fullness of faith and knowledge as the Father hath. Chapter 32, verses 27 through 37. Experimenting on the Word of God brings conversion. Elder M. Russell Ballard, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught that a willingness to perform Alma's experiment leads to conversion. Quote, We know that both members and non-members are more likely to be thoroughly converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ when they are willing to experiment upon the Word. 
This is an attitude of both mind and heart that includes a desire to know the truth and a willingness to act on that desire. Remember, that's just that's exactly what the chart is. We just witnessed. Back to Eller Ballard. For those investigating the church, the experiment can be as simple as agreeing to read the Book of Mormon, to pray about it, and to earnestly seek to know if Joseph Smith was the Lord's prophet. True conversion comes through the power of the Spirit. When the Spirit touches the hearts, hearts are changed. When individuals, both members and investigators, feel the Spirit working in them, or when they see the evidence of the Lord's love and mercy in their lives, they are edified and strengthened spiritually, and their faith in Him increases. These experiences with the Spirit flow naturally when a person is willing to experiment upon the Word. This is how we come to feel the gospel is true. End of quote. At times, the swelling motions, the enlarging of the soul, the enlightening of understanding, the beginning of delicious feelings from the Spirit of spoken of in Alma 32.28 are difficult to verbally express. However, being hard to express does not discount the truthfulness of the feeling. Chapter 32, verse 26, the phrase, You cannot know of their surety at first. There are no shortcuts to a testimony of the gospel. We cannot fully understand principles we have not lived. As John 17 says, and we have quoted before, If man will do his will, the Savior said, You shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. And understanding the principle of salvation does not come in an instant. The idea is demeaning to the principles involved. Joseph Smith did not come out of the sacred grove knowing all that was necessary for his salvation. He, like Christ, found it necessary to advance from grace to grace. To suppose that some sort of religious revival, we can obtain all the knowledge necessary to be saved, vocalizes true religion. The divine injunction the prophet Joseph Smith taught is that we seek learning even by studying, also by faith. This is that we might grow up in the knowledge of God, that we might receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost. Similarly, Paul admonished us to grow into Christ in all things. These, the things of God, said the prophet, are of deep importance, and time and experience and careful, ponderous and solemn thoughts can only find them out. I know we've already quoted that, but this is a good reminder of these spiritual truths. Chapter 32, verse 27, the phrase, Arouse your faculties. Centuries earlier, Jacob had written, O oh, my brethren, hearken to my words, arouse the faculties of your soul. Shake yourselves that you may awake from the slumber of death and lose yourselves from the pains of hell that you may not come become angels to the devil. And that's Jacob 3.11. In the midst of a fallen world, a world prone to degrade, degradation, a spiritual, spiritual decay, it is often necessary for men and women to be jolted from their carnal security and brought to the frightening realization that they are working at cross purposes to God, that they are going contrary to their own inner spiritual nature, and that they are on a collision course with misery and destruction. Such an arousal from the deep sleep of spiritual death often comes through the powerful testimony of one of the Lord's legal administrators, a witness and warning which are attended by the spirit of prophecy and revelation. Chapter 32, verse 27, the phrase, An experiment upon my words. The quest for truth is essentially an experiment on the words of Christ. The experimenter is encouraged to prove all things, hold fast to that which we that which is good. In 1 Thessalonians 5.21, we do then know. Chapter 37, verse 27, the phrase, no more than a desire to believe. This is the beginning, the introduction to true faith. Alma asks the Zoramites to desire to believe, to hope that perhaps what he is saying is true. One who approaches his or her study and experiment upon the Book of Mormon and the Gospel with a neutral attitude may miss the mark and miss the opportunity to know. There must be an openness to the possibility that the Gospel message is true. There must be a deliberate suspension of disbelief. Chapter 32, verse 27, the phrase, Give place for a portion of my words. We consider that God has created man with a mind capable of instruction, taught the prophet Joseph Smith, quote, and a fa faculty which may be enlarged in proportion to the heat and diligence given to the light communicate from heaven to the intellect. 
and that the nearer man approaches perfection, the clearer are his views and the greater his enjoyment, till he has overcome the evils of his life and lost every desire for sin, and like the ancient, arrives at the point of faith where he is wrapped in the power of glory of his Maker and is caught up to dwell with him. But we consider that this is a station to which no man ever arrived in a moment. He must have been instructed in the government and laws of that kingdom by proper degrees until his mind is capable in some measure of comprehending the property, propriety, justice, equality, and consistency of the same. End of quote. It is the will of the heavens that all men receive truth according to their ability to decipher and digest eternal verities. This concept demonstrates both divine wisdom and mercy. Men ought not to receive more than they are ready to receive. The Lord would never want to drown one in the living waters. Chapter 32, verse 28 through 30. Give place, the phrase, that a seed may be planted and begin to grow. Increased faith in God's word is one of the fruits that comes from the seeds of faith planted in the fertile ground of a soft heart. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency described the necessary prerequisite for faith and knowledge to grow and mature. He said, quote, We need to prepare our own seedbed of faith. To do this, we need to plow the soil through daily humble prayer, asking for strength and forgiveness. We need to harrow up the soul by overcoming our feelings of pride. We need to prepare the seedbed by keeping the commandments to the best of our ability. We need to be honest with the Lord in the payment of our tithes and our other offerings. We need to be worthy and able to call forth the great powers of the priesthood to bless ourselves, our families, and others for whom we have responsibility. There is no better place for the spiritual seeds of faith to be nurtured than within the hallowed sanctuary of our temples and in our homes. End of quote. The planted seed of faith does not grow suddenly. President Boy K. Packer explained the importance of patience while waiting for the seed to grow. He said, quote, My experience has been that a testimony does not burst upon us suddenly. Rather, it grows, as, ground, as Alma said, from a seed of faith. Do not be disappointed if you have read and reread and yet have not received a powerful witness. You may be somewhat like the disciples spoken of in the Book of Mormon who were filled with the power of God in great glory, and they knew it not. Do the best you can. Think of this verse. See that all things are done in wisdom and order, for it is not requisite that a man should run faster than he has strength. And again, it is expedient that he should be diligent, that thereby he might win the prize. Therefore, all things must be done in order. End of President Packer's quote. Chapter 32, verse 28, A True Seed. A true seed or correct principle is one in which faith can be exercised. It is one which, if properly understood and nourished, will grow and bring forth good fruit in its season. In this case, the seed is not some vague philosophical abstraction. Rather, the seed is something very specific. It is the word of truth concerning the coming of Christ. The proposition or principle Alma is challenging them to consider, asking them to pray about, encouraging them to experience, pertains to Christ Jesus. Chapter 32, verse 28, the phrase, Ye will resist the Spirit of the Lord. There are many that harden their hearts against the Holy Spirit, that it hath no place in them. Wherefore they cast many things away which are written, and esteem them as a thing of naught. And then you wonder why they don't have faith or believe. Chapter 32, verse 28, the phrase, Feel the swelling motions. This is the beginning of testimony. Truth is felt. We know and recognize it by a feeling within our souls. Joseph Smith wrote, quote, I was one day reading the epistle of James, first chapter and fifth verse, which reads, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Never did any passage of scripture come with more power to the heart of man than this did at this time to mine. It seemed to enter with great force into every feeling of my heart. End of quote. 
explained to Oliver Cowdery why his efforts at translation had been unsuccessful, the Lord said, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore, you shall feel that it is right. Conversely, the Savior warned the Meridian disciples against those who would not understand with their heart. Nephi spoke of his rebellious brothers as being past feeling, and Paul described those given up to uncleanliness and greed as having the understanding darkened, as being blind of heart, and as being past feeling. Chapter 32, verse 28, the phrase, It beginneth to enlarge my soul. Alma repeatedly emphasized that obtaining spiritual maturity is a process. That which of God enlarges the soul, while that which is the adversarially quietly cheateth souls and leadeth them caref away carefully down to hell. Alma 32, verse 28, the phrase, It beginneth to enlighten my understanding. Doctrine and Covenants 50 says, And that which doth not edify is not of God, and is darkness. That which is of God is light, and he that receiveth light, and continueth in God, receiveth more light. And that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. Chapter 3, verse 28, the phrase, It beginneth to be delicious to me. Describing the fruit of the tree of life, Lehi said, It filled my soul with exceedingly great joy, wherefore I began to be desirous that my family should partake of it also, for I knew that it was desirable above all other fruits. Lucy Mack Smith, Joseph's mother, records a similar vision granted her husband, Joseph Smith Sr., finding that the fruit of the tree was delicious beyond description. He also determined that he could not eat it alone. He gathered his family to the tree and invited them to eat. The more we ate, he said, the more we seemed to desire, until we even got down upon our knees and scooped it up, eating it by double handfuls. End of quote. Alma used the concept of taste to describe the growth of testimony. The prophet Joseph Smith also used taste to teach about discernment of true doctrines. He said, quote, This is a good doctrine. It tastes good. I can taste the principles of eternal life, and so can you. I know that when I tell you these words of eternal life, as they are given to me, you taste them, and I know that you believe them. You say, honey is sweet, and so do I. I can also taste the spirit of eternal life. I know that it is good. And when I tell you of these things, which are given me by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you are bound to receive them as sweet and rejoice more and more. Brothers and sisters, I have come to experience that. There are certain doctrines I have just tasted. They just taste good to your spirit and to your soul. 32 verse 29, we need not be so vain as to suppose that because we have a testimony, because we have had spiritual experiences of one sort or another, we have a perfect knowledge or even an adequate knowledge of the gospel. Chapter 32, verse 31, the phrase, For every seed bringeth forth unto its own likeness. As temporal seeds produce after their own kind, so it is with spiritual seeds. Each produces that which is in that which is in its own image and likeness. The seeds of faith produce faith. The seeds of righteousness produce righteousness. Virtue produces virtue, and so on. Conversely, meanness produces meanness. Hatred produces hatred. As vanity, impurity, hypocrisy, and all other seeds germinated in darkness and sin produce after their own kind. Those who accept the challenge to experiment upon the proposition that Jesus is the Christ do more than read and pray about him. They seek to do those things which he has commanded us to do. They do his will. They then come to know further. Those who do the works of Christ begin to receive the fruits of Christ and acquire the nature of Christ since every good thing brings forth fruit after its own likeness. To acknowledge, in this case, that the seed is good is to acknowledge that Jesus is the true Christ, that his church is true, and that his power and authority are held by his anointed servants. Chapter 32, verses 32 through 33. If a seed groweth, it is good. That's what causes the soul to grow is good and of God. Seeds that do not have that effect are to be cast away. 
All good sage, that is, all good doctrine will share characteristics in common with all other good doctrine. They will lift the soul, enlighten the mind, bring a sense of peace and joy, encourage, inspire, motivate to faithfulness, create a desire for a greater knowledge of the things of God, and attract other good seeds. That paragraph, brothers and sisters, is a good way to know, as I was asked in 35 years of professional teaching in the church, Brother Clough, how do I know if it was me that made it up or it came from God? Well, if it causes it to grow, if it brings peace, joy, encouragement, motivation, faithfulness, and desires greater knowledge, and then that is of God. Chapter 32 Verse 34 and 36, the phrase, Yea, your knowledge is perfect in that thing. Once you have received a witness of a gospel truth or doctrine because you exercise your faith, then you have a perfect knowledge in that thing, and your faith is dormant in that thing. Thus we continue to exercise faith in other principles or doctrines and not lay it aside and continue to grow because your knowledge is not full. We continue this process until we come to know all things, which knowledge is only had by becoming like God. Chapter 32, verse 34, the phrase, Your mind doth beginneth to expand. The gospel does not just stretch the heart and the soul of its adherents. It expands their minds. Sainthood cannot be found in ignorance. True religion can hardly be mindless. Indeed, the religion of the heavens must embrace an endowment to the intellect. Chapter 32, verse 35, the phrase, is not this real? Spiritual experience is real. Spiritual things are known. They cannot be explained away by reference to the physical senses and the meager means of measuring those senses. Indeed, things of the spirit descend to the core of being and can be known with greater certitude than things of the physical world. As Alma spoke to the poor Zoramites, he asked them to discern the truth of his message for themselves. One person cannot learn a gospel principle for another. Neither Neil A. Maxwell explained that each of us can know the certainty of divine truths. Quote, Alma describes the growth of faith and how faith can actually become knowledge with the accompanying intellect and emotional experiences of the believer. After the understanding of the believer has been enlarged and his mind has been expanded, Alma asks, Oh then, is not this real? It is real, he says, because it is discernible. Therefore, you must know that it is good. The truth of each divine doctrine is actually discernible by us in a system of certification and confirmation that justifies our saying, I know. End of quote. 32 verse 35, the phrase, because it is light. The light of the gospel quickens the understanding and enlightens the eye. And if your eye be single to my glory, the Lord said, your whole body shall be filled with light, and there shall be no darkness in you. And that body which is filled with light comprehendeth all things. Chapter 35, I apologize, I didn't put the verse on this. The phrase, because it is discernible. Or this is probably it's chapter 32, verse 35. The gospel of, let's, let's fix that. 32, 32, there. Now we have it corrected. Chapter 32, verse 35, the phrase, because it is discernible. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not a mystery. It is discernible. An understanding of it within the capacity of all who are expected to live it. None need be dependent for their salvation on the scholarship, understanding, and spiritual gifts and powers of others. Chapter 32, verse 35. Oh, I thought we, we caught that one. The phrase tasted this light in the midst of a great doctrinal discourse. Joseph Smith said, this is good doctrine. It tastes good. I can taste the principles of eternal life, and so can you. They are given to me by the revelations of Christ. And I know that when I tell you these words of eternal life are given to me, you taste them, and I know that you believe them. So say honey is sweet, and so do I. I can also taste the spirit of eternal life. I know it is good. And when I tell you of these things which were given to me by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, you are bound to receive them as sweet and rejoice more and more. 
again, we've already quoted that as another good reminder that the doctrines of the gospel taste good. Chapter 32, verses 37 through 43, the word, phrase, nourish the word. The spirit has the same need of nourishment as the physical body. Spiritual health requires the same attention to diet as does its physical counterpart. Many are sick or, to all intents and purposes, dead in the realm of spiritual things because the spirits have known no diet other than the mundane, the impure, the unholy. Others are spiritually anemic, having only nibbled at eternal truths and preferring to stuff their bellies with spiritual junk food. Still others who have feasted upon the meat of the gospel lack spiritual strength because they have not exercised nor used the spiritual gifts that have been given them. Spiritual strength, testimony, faith, none are the product of a moment. All must be nurtured. Each comes quietly, almost imperceptibly. Impatience is characteristic of the spiritually immature. A mistake common to the spiritually inexperienced is the establishment of deadlines for the Lord. This is done by determining that they will submit themselves to a given ritual or spiritual activity for a specific period, by which time the Lord is to have manifested himself or his will to the prescribed degree. This would This would be something akin to a parent giving a child a goal to grow a given number of inches in a prescribed period, promising rewards if they succeed and punishment should they fail. A good seed properly nourished will begin to bring forth harvest, but the season of harvest is of the Lord's choosing. It will come in its own time, in its own way, and according to his own will. Brothers and sisters, if you say I will live the gospel for this amount of time, and if I don't receive a witness, then it's not true, then you might as well just not do it at all, because you will not blackmail the Lord into him giving you a witness. Elder Bruce C. Hafen of the Quorum of Seven uses an almost metaphor of cultivation to identify two aspects of nourishment that brings the blessings of the gospel into our lives. Quote, we grow in two ways, removing negative weeds and, and cultivating po positive flowers. The Savior's grace blesses both parts if we do our part. First and repeatedly, we must uproot the weeds of sin and bad choices. It isn't enough just to mold the weeds, yank them out by the roots, repenting fully to satisfy the conditions of mercy. But being forgiven is only part of our growth. We are not just paying a debt. Our purpose is to become celestial beings. So once we've cleared out our heartland, we must continually plant weed and nurture, nourish the seeds of divine qualities. And then as our sweet and disciplined strength us to meet his gifts, the flowers of grace appear. There is sun. That's from sunshine in my soul. Like hope and meekness, even a tree of life can take root in this heart garden, bearing fruit so sweet that it enlightens all our burdens to the joy of his Son. And when the flowers of charity blossom, here we will love others with the power of Christ's own love. End of quote. Chapter 30, verse 40, the phrase, an eye of faith. The faithful look forward with an eye of faith to that which is to come, as contrasted with an eye of skepticism, doubt, or unbelief. We see now with an eye of faith, one day the pure in heart shall truly behold with their eyes that which they viewed in mortality with an eye of faith. Chapter 32, verse 42, the phrase, Behold, by and by ye shall pluck the fruit. If we so live that we nourish the seed, seek to strengthen our witness and knowledge of Christ all the days of our lives, there will come a time when we shall see as we are seen and know as we are known, and we shall partake of the tree of life in the ultimate sense, that is, partake of the glory of the celestial kingdom. We shall drink of the waters of life and, can, and eat, I'm sorry, that should be eat, Cast that typo. And eat of the hidden manna in exaltation evermore. Chapter 32, verses 37 to 38, and 42 to 43. 
being a disciple of Christ. President Dieter F. Dorsey, the first president, he taught members of the church how to become a disciple of Christ. Quote, this is the peaceful way of the follower of Christ. Nevertheless, it is not a quick fix or an overnight cure. A friend of mine recently wrote to me, conf confiding that he was having a difficult time keeping his testimony strong and vibrant. He asked for counsel. I wrote back to him and lovingly suggested a few specific things he could do that would align his life more closely with the teachings of the restored gospel. To my surprise, I heard back from him only a week later. The essence of the letter was this. I tried what you suggested. It didn't work. What else have you got? Brothers and sisters, we have to stay with it. We don't acquire eternal life in a sprint. This is a race of endurance. We have to apply and reapply the divine gospel principles day after day. We need to make them a part of normal life. Too often we approach the gospel like a farmer who plants a seed in the ground and then in the morning the ground in the morning and expects corn on the cob by the afternoon. When Alma compared the word of God to a seed, he explained that the seed grows into a fruit-bearing tree gradually as a result of our faith and our diligence and patience and long-suffering. It's true that some things come right away. Soon after we plant the seed in our hearts, it begins to swell and sprout and grow, and by this we know that the seed is good. From the very moment we set foot upon a pathway of discipleship, seen and unseen blessings from God begin to attend us. But we cannot receive the fullness of those blessings if we neglect the tree and take no thought for its nourishment. Knowing that the seed is good is not enough. We must nourish it with great care that it may get root. Only then can we partake of the fruit that is sweet above all that is sweet and pure above all that is pure and feast upon the fruit even until we are filled that we hunger not, neither shall we thirst. Discipleship is a journey. We need the refining lesson of the journey. We need the refining lessons of the journey to craft our character and purify our hearts. By patiently walking the path of discipleship, we demonstrate to ourselves the measures of our faith and our willingness to accept God wills rather than ours. It is not enough to merely to speak of Christ or to proclaim that we are his disciples. It is not enough to surround ourselves with symbols of our religion. Discipleship is not a specter, spectator sport. We cannot expect to experience the blessings of faith by standing inactive on the sidelines any more than we can experience the benefits of health by sitting on a sofa, watching sporting events on television, and giving advice to the athletes. And yet, for some, spectator discipleship is preferred, if not a primary way of worshiping. Ours is not a second-hand religion. We cannot receive the blessings of the gospel merely by observing the good that others do. We need to get off the sidelines and practice what we preach. Now is the time to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, become his disciple, and walk in his ways. End of Elder Uchtdorf's quote. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this helped with faith, developing faith, and continuing our journey so that one day we can come to know in God's time and according to God's way all things that are true and to become like him and have a knowledge of all things. If you if this presentation helped you, please hit the like button.